today's session is going to be very very important for a final year MBBS graduate who is about to appear for his final year exams okay. So we are going to discuss about uh, instruments that are important for obstetrics and gynecology okay. So now regarding the various instruments just look at this say this is the uterus okay and say this is the vagina inside which you have the cervix okay so here you have the cervix which is the continuation of the uterus this is the broad ligament and this is say whatever is painted black here is the fallopian tube okay now all these structures are not same in consistency okay they differ in their consistency say for example a non-pregnant uterus is firm in consistency a non-pregnant cervix is again firm in consistency whereas a pregnant cervix is soft in consistency vagina is usually soft in consistency okay and this is a thin ligament the broad ligament and the fallopian tubes are delicate structures okay so you will not be using the same instrument to hold every structure it is not going to be the same because their consistencies are different okay the instrument that you use should not damage the tissue and at the same time should expose the area that you want to see in a better way okay this is one point the second point is see the external genitalia and the internal genitalia are continuous okay and through the external genitalia you can actually access to the intercate access to the internal genitalia and that internal genitalia is nothing but the cervix the uterus and the fallopian tubes okay now please listen that the two walls of the vagina the anterior and the posterior walls of the vagina are not open okay the anterior and posterior walls of the vagina are approximated okay they remain approximated in a normal lady so if you have to see the inner part of the vagina if you want to see the mucus of the vagina and if you want to further see the upper genital tract through the vagina the anterior and posterior walls of the vagina should be forced open okay they should be opened like this and to keep them open we need to insert an instrument open which will keep the anterior and posterior walls of the vagina apart so that you can see the cervix inside and through the cervix you can insert something through the os to reach the uterus and sometimes to the coronal end of the fallopian tube also okay so these are mainly facilitated by certain instruments which we will be seeing uh, now okay so what is the first instrument for today the first instrument for today is this okay the first instrument for today is this okay what is this this is sims double bladed posterior vaginal wall speculum okay sims double bladed non self retaining posterior vaginal wall speculum and this is also called as duck bill speculum okay so what do we use the speculum for as I already told you the anterior and the posterior walls of the vagina remain attached or they are um, you know opposed to each other and to see the vaginal mucosa and the cervix we need to separate them by inserting a speculum like this okay. Now I insert the speculum see this is not the actual way of inserting the speculum okay what we have to do is see you have to hold the speculum like this okay and initially insert the speculum with the anteroposterior axis of the uh, speculum like this okay with 90 degrees to the uh, uh, vaginal wall okay so insert the speculum like this it is called a posterior vaginal wall speculum because we usually rotate it like this in the transverse position and then rotate the speculum by 90 degrees to bring it to the posterior vaginal wall okay so now you rest it on the posterior vaginal wall you can see a white pink structure protruding inside okay and that white pink structure is nothing but the cervix okay so this is sims double bladed posterior vaginal wall speculum okay and now if you ask me should it be used only to retract the posterior vaginal wall answer is no you can also use this to retract the anterior vaginal wall okay so you can either retract the anterior vaginal wall lift the anterior vaginal wall up or you retract the posterior vaginal wall it is for dual purpose okay now more details about this speculum okay remember this speculum has got a 
two ends okay one upper and lower ends and if you carefully note this the upper and the lower or uh, these two ends will not be of the same size okay their sizes will vary one will be big and the other will be small and usually they come in combinations of 26 31 31 36 and 36 41 so there will be five millimeter difference between the two ends okay usually there will be five millimeter difference between the two ends okay the second question that a final, uh, a final year student will face when he is facing the examiner in his practical examination is should it always be a double bladed okay no it need not always be double bladed we do have single bladed speculum as well because a double bladed speculum is better than a single bladed speculum because the sizes are different and according to the size of the vagina we can choose the size of the speculum and the side which has to be inserted into the vagina okay so double bladed speculum is uh, has more advantage okay the next is if you look at the speculum you can see that there is a depression running here okay so this is for the secretions to drain because we have the cervix inside and you all know cervix has got columnar epithelium which is secretory in nature and it secretes mucus okay vagina as such does not have any secretory activity because it is lined by stratified squamous epithelium so all the secretions that are present in the vagina are either derived from the cervix or they are sheddings of the vaginal epithelium okay so this is for the secretion to uh, drain okay fine now what are the advantages and disadvantages of this speculum that is what the examiner will ask you next okay so please listen students the advantage of this speculum is that once you put the speculum this speculum will not hide the entire vagina okay now see this speculum retracts the posterior vaginal wall and at the same time you are able to see the anterior vaginal wall you are able to see part of the posterior vaginal wall as, wall as well and you can freely move the speculum to see all parts of the vagina you will not miss any portion of the vagina okay so this speculum can be used to inspect both the vagina as well as the cervix inside okay so this is the biggest advantage of this speculum okay now what are the disadvantages of this speculum okay the disadvantage of this speculum is that you will require an assistant to hold the speculum okay this is not self retaining so if you take your hand it will fall okay so you need an assistant to hold the speculum okay the second point is that this will hit on the table and therefore the patient has to come to the edge of the table so that the patient's hymen is at the level of edge of the table and the speculum is nicely hanging down okay so these are the two important disadvantages okay this is not self-retaining you need an assistant to hold this and the second is patient has to be at the edge of the table okay so um, this is not suitable for colposcopy i'll tell you what colposcopy is colposcopy is a procedure to visualize the uh, uh, cervix the transformation zone of the cervix and this is uh, not the best speculum to uh, do a colposcopy because um, someone has to um, keep uh, holding it okay so these are these are the disadvantages fine now what are the indications whenever you want to see the vagina whenever you want to see the cervix say for example you want to you you have a suspicion of the case being a cervical cancer or um, you want to see whether the os is stenosed or os is open and you want to examine the vagina you can use this speculum okay say for example you are doing any procedure through the cervix like hysterosalpingogram or hysteroscopy or a vaginal hysterectomy or dilatation and curettage or colpotomy or caldocentesis for all these procedures we will be using this speculum okay since double bladed uh, uh, non self retaining posterior vaginal wall speculum okay the second important use of this speculum is uh, during uh, delivery okay in the postpartum period whenever we suspect any tears in the cervix or in the fornix or in the vagina we can use the speculum to see the fornix and the vagina to see if there is any tear okay so the, these are the indications uh, for this use of sims speculum okay next along with the sims speculum 
you should also know something about sims position okay sims position what is sims position whatever you see in this picture is sims position where the lady will lie on uh, her left lateral position okay left lateral position with the right knee and thigh drawn upwards so this is the right buttock right knee and uh, right thigh okay drawn upward towards the chest and the left arm this is the left arm the left arm along the back okay so this is what is called as sims position so where do we use this sims position sims position is used to examine the anterior wall of the vagina okay sims position is you is the best to position to examine the anterior wall of the uh, vagina okay so supposing you want to see if there is any bulge in the anterior wall say it is a bladder bulging through the vagina which is called a cystocele or the urethra bulging through the vagina which is called as rectocele you can examine in sims position okay so we will move on to the next instrument here the next instrument is this okay what instrument is this? This is called as Cusco's self-retaining bivalved posterior vaginal, I mean vaginal uh, speckle. We don't use the word posterior here because we have two blades. One will rest on the anterior and the other will rest on the posterior vaginal wall. Okay. So Cusco's self-retaining bivalved vaginal speculum. Okay. Now what is the advantage of this speculum over the Sims speculum? This speculum uh, has got two blades so simultaneously it will retract the anterior and the posterior vaginal walls okay so at times you know what even if we retract the posterior vaginal wall with sims the anterior vaginal wall would be sagging down like this and in, in that case you will require one more speculum to retract the anterior vaginal wall so two Two, uh, two speculums will be, two sim speculum will be inserted, one retracting the posterior and the other retracting the anterior vaginal wall to see the cervix inside of the cervix is very much deep inside and the vagina is sagging, okay. That problem is not there with the Cusco speculum because Cusco speculum has two blades, one will retract the anterior and the other will retract the posterior vaginal wall. This is the first advantage, okay. What is the second advantage here? The second advantage is that it has a screw, okay. It has a screw. So, now uh, see I unlock the screw, the blades are closed, okay. Now, if I push here, if I, uh, you know, press here, the blades will open, okay the blades will open so the anterior and posterior see this is the posterior vaginal wall and this is the anterior vaginal wall once the blades open the vagina is now retracted and the vagina opens like this okay and now I will tighten the screw so that it does not uh, fall again okay so this is a self retaining speculum okay two words are important one is it has two blades simultaneous retraction of the anterior and the posterior vaginal wall the second is screw is there so it is self retaining self you don't need an assistant it is self retaining okay but what is the disadvantage of this speculum the disadvantage is that you will not be able to see the vagina because it has two blades and it will completely occlude the vagina okay it will not be used to see the vagina okay again this how will you insert you will first insert this with 90 degrees at 90 degrees to the uh, vagina uh, the vagina and then you will turn at 90 degrees to place the blades anteriorly and posteriorly okay so initially it will be like this with the handles here and then turn at 90 degree and then open it to kind of place it in the normal position okay so this is about uh, the Cusco's self uh, retaining speculum okay so it covers the anterior and the posterior vaginal wall decreased maneuverability and less space to perform okay now having understood this what more can an examiner ask you if you are a final year student appearing for the practical exam okay if you have chosen any of these instruments say some speculum or a Cusco speculum okay so you understand that basically these speculums are used to see the vagina and the cervix okay so as an undergraduate student you have to know what all changes you have to see in the cervix 
and what is transformation zone okay what is transformation zone transformation zone is where the columnar epithelium is replaced by squamous epithelium okay say this is the cervix and this is the vagina okay and say this is the columnar epithelium which is single layered okay say this is the cervix and this is the vagina and this is the columnar epithelium which is single layered and say this is the a uh, squamous epithelium which is a uh, multi layered and there is a point where the columnar and the squamous meet and this is called the squamo columnar junction okay now whenever i ask my students what is transformation zone the usual answer that they give is squamo columnar junction okay but students please remember columnar i mean uh, squamo columnar junction is not the same as transformation zone okay now so to understand transformation zone you please understand that estrogen is one hormone which helps in opening up of the cervix okay now the original squamo columnar junction see this is where the squamous and the columnar meet the original squamo columnar junction is a point which is usually present within the canal of the cervix and that means within the endo cervix okay now when will this squamo columnar junction protrude into the vagina or get exposed to the vagina only after estrogen comes into play okay so what happens after estrogen comes the cervix opens a little okay say this is the external os and this is the internal os okay now this external os once estrogen comes into play opens a little like this further opens further opens further opens and now the columnar epithelium which is inside is exposed to the acidic ph of the vagina okay so once the columnar epithelium is exposed to the acidic ph of the vagina okay this columnar epithelium cannot withstand the acidic ph and it tries to become a more resistant squamous epithelium and that process of columnar getting converted to squamous is called as metaplasia okay this is called as metaplasia okay so because of this what happens see this is the uh, columnar epithelium okay and see here was where we had the old squamo columnar junction okay now the columnar epithelium above this will initially become squamous and then further layers will become squamous and further layers will become squamous so what is happening the columnar epithelium is gradually getting replaced by squamous epithelium okay so columnar epithelium is replaced by squamous epithelium and now this is where you have the new squamo columnar junction okay so this is where you have the new squamo columnar junction so old squamo columnar junction is a static area whereas the new squamo columnar junction is a transitional uh, air meeting it is a moving area okay it is not a fixed point it is a moving point okay so it is moving upwards or downwards it is moving upwards the new squamo columnar junction is moving upwards okay so what is transformation zone transformation zone is where the columnar has become squamous okay that means i would say transformation zone transformation zone is the area between old and the new squamo columnar junction area between old and the new squamo columnar junction and this transformation zone is filled with newly formed squamous cells newly formed squamous cells okay so what is the examiner likely to ask you she might ask you what is transformation zone and in that case your answer will be as an undergraduate please listen madam transformation zone is the area between the old and the new squamo columnar junction which is uh occupied by newly formed squamous cells okay this will be a complete answer okay next is ectopy what is ectopy it is just the ulta of transformation zone transformation zone is where columnar becomes squamous ectopy is where 
uh, squamous becomes columnar okay so ectopy that is cervical ectopy okay the next instrument for now is this okay now look at this instrument there are two ends with a shaft now the distal end of this instrument is hollow which can fit a syringe in okay and the proximal end of the instrument has got tooth sharp tooth and they are serrated okay so this instrument is endometrial biopsy curate okay this is a metallic in, uh, endometrial biopsy curate we do have a uh, plastic curates like this okay plastic endometrial biopsy curate whatever i am showing you is metallic and those plastic uh, ones are called as pipples endometrial biopsy curate okay pipples endometrial uh, biopsy uh, curate okay so fine now what do we do with this like how we used uh, this one to uh, to take samples from the endometrium this one again we used to take samples from the endometrium to see if there is any endometrial cancer or endometrial hyperplasia or you know to see if there is any corpus luteal insufficiency uh, in the second half of the menstrual cycle to see if the lady has ovulated okay so this is endometrial biopsy curate to diagnose infertility to diagnose endometrial cancer endometrial cancer or hyperplasia in case of uh, dysfunctional uterine bleeding or abnormal uterine bleeding okay you can also use it as a uterine sound because you have an angle here okay see there it is bent here okay so i will tell you what is uterine sound and there you will understand for now just remember you can also use it as a uterine sound okay fine the next instrument for now is this okay now what instrument is this this instrument has got a central shaft with one proximal and one distal end okay the proximal end is a spiral cone okay it has spiral uh, uh, this thing in it a uh, spiral cone and uh, the the distal end has a lower lock mount okay so with this you can attach a syringe okay through this i'm opening this you can actually fix a syringe here a syringe here okay at this end okay now what is it used for now what i do with this instrument is say this is the uh, vagina and say this is the cervix i insert this instrument into the cervix like this and i screw the proximal end into the cervix in such a way that it does not slip out and the screw enters into the cervical canal completely now the cervical canal is completely the, the shaft has completely the screw has completely entered the cervical canal and the tip of the screw is at the level of internal os and this will be at the level of external os and now what i will do is push die okay radio opaque die through the distal end of the instrument and this will now enter the uterine cavity the dye will now enter the uterine cavity and through the fallopian tubes the dye will spill into the peritoneal cavity and now i will be taking x ray so i will be able to study the dye filled area here okay so what is the name of this instrument the, the name of this instrument is leach wilkinson cannula okay it is leach wilkinson cannula so what are the probable questions the examiner will ask you the examiner will first ask you to identify and it is very easy to identify with the screwed end only you can say that this is leach wilkinson cannula okay examiner will now ask you the uses of this instrument so you can say it is used for hysterosalpingography hsg and hsg means hysterosalpingography okay this can also be used uh, during laparoscopy to see the uh, patency of the tube hsg is a procedure which is done without anesthesia but to hsg is a screening procedure to con to confirm that it is a blocked tube we will be subjecting the patient for laparoscopy and for laparoscopic chromoperturbation also we will be using the same cannula that is uh, uh, leach wilkinson cannula okay previously we had a test called rubin's test okay what is rubin's test rubin's test is where we insert a cannula through the cervix and pass gas through this cannula which will go into the uterine cavity and if the tubes are patent the gas while passing through the tubes will produce a hissing sound and with which with this we can actually uh, see whether the tubes are patent okay this is rubin's test 
because Rubin's test is a subjective test, it is not an objective test and in Rubin's you do not get a film like how we get in HSG, Rubin's test has become obsolete, okay. Rubin's test is obsolete because Rubin's test is based on gas passing through the tubes, gas passing through the tubes and Rubin's test is subjective, it is not objective. For these reasons, Rubin's test is not done nowadays. What is done is only HSG followed by laparoscopic chromoperturbation. We also have one other test called SSG, okay. What is SSG? SSG is saline sono salpingography. Saline sono salpingography, okay. So, what is the difference between HSG and SSG? In HSG, we uh, use dye and take x-ray. We use radio opaque dye and take x-ray, okay. Whereas, in saline sonosalpingography, we use saline and because saline is not radio opaque, we use ultrasound Doppler. We use ultrasound Doppler to see if the fluid is moving through the fallopian tubes, okay. So, that is why sono, the word sono because we use ultrasound, okay. So, this is HSG and this is SSG. And now the examiner might ask you the other name of SSG. Please remember the other name of SSG is Sion test, okay. The other name of SSG is Sion test, okay. Now, if you are able to tell all these, the next few questions will be what is the ideal time to do HSG, what are the advantages of HSG and the diagnosis that you can get, okay. Ideal time to perform HSG is follicular phase, follicular phase and it will be day 7 to day 9, day 7 to day 9. Why day 7 to day 9? Some women might get her periods uh, up to day 6 and in that case when you do a HSG, you will make the uh, menstrual blood pass through the fallopian tube and spill into the peritoneal cavity which will predispose to endometriosis, okay. So, if done before endometriosis, if done before the bleeding actually stops, okay, before bleeding stops. So, give a gap of 6 days from the onset of bleeding and then do it on day 7, okay. Before bleeding stops, if you do, you will predispose the lady to endometriosis. And after day 9, if you do, there are chances that the lady would ovulate and in that case, the pregnancy would get missed in that particular cycle. So, um, so anyway, we are exposing the patient to x-ray. So, we will not ask the patient to conceive in that particular cycle, but if conceived naturally occurs for this reason we will not abort okay so we will better avoid doing it after day 9 so the ideal time will be day 7 to day 9 in the follicular phase okay what are the advantage of HSG, advantages of HSG over laparoscopy see HSG not only detects um, you know tubal block H only, HSG not only detects tubal block but also detects uterine anomalies uterine anomalies Adhesions, adhesions inside the uterine cavity, fibroids inside the uterine cavity, okay, that means submucous fibroids and it also diagnoses cervical incompetence. It also tells the shape of the cervix, so you will get to know the, um, the, the shape of the cervix, okay. So, you have this many advantages in HSG. It not only tells you about the patency of the tubes, but also the uh, shape of the uterine cavity, the presence of fibroids or adhesions inside the uterine cavity, the presence of septum in the uterine cavity, all about uterine cavity and cervix, okay. So, this is uh, what you can expect from the examiner when you get this instrument, Leach-Wilkinson cannula, okay. The next instrument here is this, okay. I have a set of these instruments here, okay. So, what is this, this is Hegar's dilator, okay. The name of this dilator is important. This is Hegar's dilator, okay. So, we have various sizes in this Hegar's dilator starting from the thinnest one to the thickest one I have in my hand, okay. No, so um, what are the possible questions that can be asked from this Hegar's dilator, okay. So, we, we have a set in which we have 6 to 12 
uh, numbers and the smallest will measure 1 to 2 mm. Okay, the smallest will measure 1 to 2 mm and it goes up to 26 mm. Okay, it goes up to 26 mm. It is double ended but remember both the ends will not be of the same uh, thickness. Okay, this uh, the, the ends will differ in thickness by 1 millimeter. Very important point. The ends will differ in thickness by 1 millimeter. Okay. So, where do we use this Higgard's dilator? Whenever the cervix os is closed. Whenever the os is closed, we want to open the os, we will use this dilator. Okay. So, where all would we want to open the os? Whenever we want to enter the uterine cavity, we will open the os. Okay. So, where all we want to enter into the uterine cavity? When we want to perform a dilatation and curettage, scrape the endometrium. When we want to insert a bigger instrument uh, called the uterine curette, we will initially dilate uh, with the dilator, serial dilators, gradually we will increase the thickness from the thinnest one and then slowly it will open up and finally we will move on to the thickest one. Okay, and then we will insert the curette, go inside the uterus and scrape the uterine wall. This is the main use of a uh, dilator okay so for a dilatation and curettage for a dilatation and curettage i already told you what is for the gill surgery okay for the gill surgery is amputation of the cervix to so to prevent the cervix from getting stenosed we will dilate the cervix also used in for the gills any hysteroscopic procedure we inter where we introduce the camera through the cervix into the uterus and to drain uterine fluids and to test for incompetent os. This is one important, you know, point about Higgard's dilator, okay. So, incompetent os means, remember, number 6 Higgard's dilator. When you can easily insert a number, see here, I, I don't know if you can see numbers are written here. This is actually number 7 Higgard's dilator. So, this is number 6 Higgard's dilator, okay. So, here numbers are there in the middle. So, if you can insert this number 6 Higgard's dilator freely into the uh, oz, if without any resistance, if it goes into the oz, it means the oz is already open, okay. So, to diagnose cervical incompetence, if you tell this point, you will get additional marks, okay. This is about Higgard's dilator, okay, fine. Now, we have another dilator called Hawkin Ambler dilator. This is uh, Hawkin Ambler dilator, but we are not using this ha Hawkin Ambler di dilator because Hegar's dilator has two ends with different sizes and this is very useful, more useful than Hawkin Ambler's dilator, okay. So, what we are going to see next is a uh, Doin's retractor, okay. So, this is a Doin's retractor. What is it used for? It is used to retract the anterior abdominal wall when we perform a cesarean section. Usually in obstetrics and gynecology, we use it during cesarean section to retract the bladder. Say this is the uterus and this is the vagina and say the bladder is sitting on the top. Say the bladder is sitting on the top of the uterus and the vagina like this, this white sheet is the bladder. What we do is we separate the UV fold of peritoneum and we put this retractor into this area between the bladder and say this white thing is bladder, this blue thing is the uterus. We put it inside like this and we drag the bladder down. Okay, we drag the bladder down so that it does not interfere with the operating area. Okay, so this is Doin's retractor. Okay, so um, we use it during cesarean, we use it during laparotomy, we use it in abdominal hysterectomies, uh, repair of prolapse and so on. Okay, fine. The next instrument for now is uh, this. Okay, look at this instrument. Uh, so, how do I uh, describe this instrument? This instrument has got a triangular tip. Okay, see the tip? It is triangular, okay. It has a triangular tip and also it has transverse serrations in it, okay. So, inside it has transverse uh, serrations in it, okay. So, where do we use this? We use this instrument to hold the cut ends of the uterus in case of cesarean section, okay. So, cut edge of the lower segment in cesarean section. So, why do we use this? We use this because it is uh, not 100% atraumatic but it is atraumatic to some extent because it has only transverse serrations and it does not have a sharp tooth. It does not cause much damage to the cut ends of the uterus. Okay. So, this is called as green 
armitage forceps okay this is called as green armitage forceps okay so you to hold the contents of the uterus in case of cesarean section and you can also use it to hold the cervix you can use it uh, to hold any soft structure okay so that's green armitage forceps okay so the next instrument for now is this okay what is this instrument called as this instrument is called as sponge holding forceps okay so how do you describe the sponge holding forceps see this this sponge holding forceps has a central shaft it has a lock okay it also has ring shaped ends okay so in green armitage it was triangular end here ring shaped end okay this also has transverse serrations in it also i told you green armitage has transverse serrations this also has transverse serrations in the uh, in it in its inner surface okay so where do we use this basically these transverse serrations are not very traumatic like how we have in alice forceps in alice forceps or valsalam we have tooth like things but here uh, those tooth are not there okay so um what do we do we use this sponge holding forceps to hold the cervix say this is the vagina we will expose the uh, uh, cervix with a speculum and now we will hold the cervix with this sponge holding forceps okay and now remember this uh, cervix need not always be held up with the uh, uh, sponge holding forceps we can also use one other instrument called valsalam to hold the cervix but whenever the cervix is soft say for example a pregnant cervix then valsalam would not be the ideal one because valsalam has sharp tooth okay so in that case you will use sponge holding forceps okay to hold the cervix especially a pregnant cervix okay so where all will you hold a pregnant cervix in case of postpartum hemorrhage to see if there are any tears in the cervix to to pack the uterus in case of postpartum hemorrhage okay for copper t insertion cervical tears and abortions and to remove retained products of conception so these five points are very important points when it comes to obstetric use of sponge holding forceps okay so what are the obstetric uses of sponge holding forceps to uh, examine the cervix in case of traumatic pph to pack the uterus in case of atonic pph to remove any retained products of conception in case of or secondary pph to insert copper t and for abortions and mtp okay now this can also be used to hold the gauze pieces to paint the abdomen before we operate on the patient okay so these are the uses of sponge holding forceps okay the next thing that you're seeing here is ovum forceps right now i don't have an ovum forceps here okay but then what is ovum forceps ovum forceps is where we have a central shaft okay and we have a spoon shaped end okay spoon shaped end central shaft and a spoon shaped end that's ovum forceps so what is ovum forceps used for ovum forceps is used to, to remove the retained products of conception in mtp we use it for dilatation and evacuation okay that's ovum forceps the main difference between ovum forceps and this sponge holding forceps is that sponge holding forceps will have a lock okay sponge holding forceps will have lock whereas ovum forceps will not have lock okay sponge holding forceps will have lock ovum forceps will not have have lock and in that way ovum forceps will not crush the tissue okay it will not crush the tissue okay okay the next instrument that we're going to see here is this okay so this instrument is called a valsalam okay valsalam fine so this instrument is a curved instrument it has a lock it has a central shaft it has a curved tip and it has a lock okay this is how you will describe and now once you open the instrument inside you can see yes tooth like serrations okay they are not transverse serrations like how we saw with a sponge holding forceps these are tooth like serrations so you can compare these two instruments okay the inner part of it here is transverse okay transverse serrations and here they are tooth like sharp serrations okay so this is a uh, valsalam okay so where do we use valsalam valsalam is mainly used to 
hold the cervix okay but can we hold a pregnant cervix with valsalam answer is no valsalam cannot be used to hold a pregnant cervix because it's very sharp and it might cause damage and a pregnant cervix is soft okay so you have to uh, use it only for gynec purposes that means gynec purpose means whenever you want to take a biopsy from the cervix or whenever you want to hold the cervix for you know a property interval property insertion whenever you want to do a colposynthesis or a caldocentesis what is colposynthesis or a caldocentesis see a uh, caldocentesis is where say this is the uterus this is the cervix and this is the vagina you will insert a needle through the posterior fornix this is the posterior fornix you will insert a needle through the posterior fornix into the pouch of douglas and aspirate the fluid that is present in the pouch of douglas and this is what is called as caldocentesis and to perform this caldocentesis you will have to hold the cervix and lift it up and we use valsalam for that purpose okay so how do you insert the valsalam valsalam has to be inserted like this okay now you will hold the um, you know vagina you will retract the vagina like this with a speculum you will insert the valsalam like this with this concavity facing upwards okay with the concavity facing upwards this is how you have to insert and this can either hold the anterior lip or it can hold the posterior lip whichever is required okay so um, this is about valsalam okay so the next instrument is this okay i am opening this instrument this instrument is ali's forceps okay this is ali's forceps this is just like a valsalam but the, the difference is valsalam is uh, longer than this this ali's forceps is uh, comparatively short and valsalam is curved valsalam is curved the tip is curved whereas ali's is a straight one okay ali's is a straight one this is ali's forceps and in turn in ali's we have um a short medium and long ali's we have three sizes here short medium and long ali's okay so where do we use this this ali's forceps again has tooth um, on the uh, proximal end it has tooth on the proximal end so this is very sharp and traumatic and therefore it should not be used to hold delicate structures like fallopian tubes or the bowel uh, or the bladder okay this only should be used to hold tough structures like rectus sheath okay so we basically use it to hold the cutens of the vagina during hysterectomy okay so we hold the cutens of the vagina during abdominal hysterectomy or vaginal hysterectomy we also use it uh, to hold the cervix in case of hysterectomies and uh, sometimes we also hold the fundus of the uterus in case of a vaginal hysterectomy okay basically this instrument is used to hold the rectus sheath okay so whenever examiner asks you you have to first tell rectus sheath apart from rectus sheath this can also be uh, used to hold the vagina or the cervix or the fundus of the uterus in hysterectomies okay oh, fine so this is about ali's forceps okay the next one is uh, this babcock's forceps okay so i don't have a babcock's forceps with me now but i will explain what it is okay now bab Cox's forceps is similar to Ali's forceps. It also has a uh, lock, but Babcock's forceps does not have uh, the tooth that are present in Ali's. Okay, so Babcock's forceps has a triangulated blade. So you can see this triangle-shaped blade. Okay, it has a triangulated blade, and it has a transverse groove. Okay, in this area, there is a transverse groove. There is a transverse groove okay and this is comparatively atraumatic okay this is atraumatic and this also has various sizes like ali's forceps the small medium and a uh, long one okay so where do we use it we, we we basically use it to hold delicate structures and that delicate structure means in tubal ligation okay to hold the fallopian tubes to hold the fallopian tubes to hold the bowel to hold the ovary whenever we operate on the ovary say it's endometriosis 
to hold the ovary, to hold the ureter, where in type 2 or type 3 hysterectomy is to hold the ureter, okay, to hold the bladder, okay, to hold the bladder in bladder related surgeries. So, to hold delicate structures like fallopian tubes, bowel, bladder, uh, ovary, uh, ureter, we use Babcock's forceps, okay. So, it is Babcock's forceps, okay, fine. So, next important point is uh, if at all examiner wants to ask something more here, she might ask you about uh, uh, the procedure, sterilization procedure, okay. So, where, what is the name of the technique and what is the site for the sterilization procedure? Name of the technique is modified pomeroy's technique, okay. We call it MPT in short and that MPT is nothing but modified pomeroy's technique, okay. And where do we exactly do this modified pomeroy's? Which segment of the tube? It is ampulla of the tube, okay. We do this modified pomeroy's tubal ligation. Should not be done in ampulla. It should be done in the asthmus, okay. We do it in the isthmus. Why isthmus? Why not ampulla? Because ampulla is the site for fertilization. Ampulla is the site for fertilization. And therefore, it is not ideal to damage the ampulla. We have to preserve the ampulla and therefore, it has to be done at isthmus. Okay, fine. This is, yeah, the next instrument is this. Okay, what is this? This is episiotomy scissor. Okay, episiotomy scissor. Fine. So, when you take this instrument, what all MCQs or questions you will expect from this episiotomy scissor, okay. This is called as busk episiotomy scissor, B-U-S-C-H, busk episiotomy scissor, okay. The normal length of this scissor is around 16 centimeters and remember, this scissor has got an angulation, okay. It has it is angulated by 45 degrees, okay. Now, why is it angulated, okay, for the ease of insertion, okay, for the ease of insertion and also remember if it is straight, we might injure the anal sphincter and uh, we, we have four types of episiotomy. One is midline episiotomy. See, this is the vagina and this is the anus. And this is the perineal body, okay. Now, any incision in the perineum that is given like this in the midline is midline episiotomy, okay. Any incision that is given at an angle of 45 degree is medio lateral episiotomy, medio lateral episiotomy. We also have lateral episiotomy and we have a J shaped episiotomy, but remember. Lateral and J-shaped episiotomy are not in practice now. What we are practicing is only this midline and mediolateral out of which mediolateral episiotomy is the most commonly practiced one, mediolateral episiotomy, okay. Now, examiner will ask you all these and additionally, examiner can also ask you the advantages and disadvantages of mediolateral episiotomy, okay. So, what are the advantages of mediolateral episiotomy? Advantage, the main advantage of mediolateral episiotomy is that mediolateral episiotomy will not damage the anal sphincter, okay. So, less damage to sphincter, less damage to the anal sphincter, okay. So, next point is remember it also causes uh, less damage to the uh, anal mucosa or the rectal mucosa. So, the chances of complete perineal tear are very less, okay. But the disadvantage is that there is more blood loss and poor healing when compared to medial episiotomy, okay. There is more blood loss with mediolateral episiotomy and the healing is delayed, healing is delayed with mediolateral episiotomy. Okay, whereas with midline episiotomy, sphincter injuries are more common, sphincter injuries are more common, but blood loss will be less. Okay, blood loss will be less and healing will be good. Okay, healing will be good. Okay, so this is about the types of incisions. 
Next, examiner will ask you the structures that are usually cut in case of an episiotomy. What are the structures that are cut in an episiotomy? Okay. So, the structures that are cut are posterior vaginal wall, superficial and deep transverse perineal muscles, bulbospongiosis, fascia covering these muscles and pudendal vessels and nerves okay so these are the structures cut during an episiotomy okay posterior vaginal wall superficial and deep transverse perineal muscles bulbospongiosis fascia covering the muscles and transverse perineal branch of pudendal vessels and nerves okay so this is it about so what is the usual the usual cutting angle is 60 degree but then after the baby is born that 60 degree would become 45 degrees okay so what is the next instrument the next instrument is this okay what is this this is umbilical cord cutting scissors okay this is umbilical cord cutting scissors this is usually uh, 10.5 centimeter long okay and the blades will be curved okay so you can see that the blades are curved here okay so they will meet the tip see the middle portion of it has not met but the tips are facing each other they meeting okay so this prevents the cord from slipping while cutting okay so this is about umbilical cord scissor okay the next important instrument is this okay what is this this is uterine sound okay this instrument is called as uterine sound okay so what do we use it for this uh, uh, instrument is used to measure the utero cervical length okay first point not only to measure the uterine cervical length this instrument is also used to measure the version of the uterus the flexion and version whether it is anti-flexion or retroflexion so that can be seen with uterine sound okay the third is this can be uh, used to differentiate inversion from prolapse this can be used to differentiate uterine inversion from uterine prolapse okay so the three important uses for this instrument okay this is a metallic instrument which is curved okay and it has uh, a 45 degrees of angulation okay and also remember this instrument is graduated you have graduations here okay and this instrument will be inserted into the os like this and now when we insert it into the os like this what we will be doing is at the level of external os we will keep our finger like this okay and put it inside the os okay now you all know what is flexion and what is version if the uterus is bent forwards like this okay this is anti flexion if the uterus is bent backwards like this this is retroflexion okay so flexion is the angle between the uterus and the cervix okay what is flexion flexion is the angle between angle between uterus and cervix okay what is version version is the angle between cervix and vagina okay say this is the uterus this is the cervix this is the vagina Okay, this angle is flexion and this angle is version. Okay, what is the normal angle of flexion? That will be the next question to you. The normal angle of flexion is 120 degrees and the normal angle of version. So, it's like this. It's like this. Okay, this is the uterus, this is the cervix and this is the vagina. The normal angle of version, this angle is 90 degrees and this angle is 120 degrees. So, this will tell you when, when it goes inside only we can judge on which direction it goes and that is why it is actually angulated. So, this will tell you whether it is flexed uterus, uh, anti-flexion or retroflexion, anti-version or retroversion. Okay, so the next important instrument is this. Okay, what is this? This instrument is a myoma screw and this instrument has a spiral curved uh, tip okay with a sharp edge okay so this is a myoma screw okay what do we do with this we put this on the uterus and we screw it inside the uterus okay we do it like this and when we make rotatory movements this will gradually enter into the uterus and have a grip over the uterus so this 
can be the uterus can be held like this we use it during hysterectomies okay we also use it uh, for uh, screwing the myoma and removing the myoma and hence we call it a myoma screw okay now once you see this instrument only the examiner might ask you the indications for myomectomy or the indications for hysterectomy okay so what are the indications for hysterectomy the indications for hysterectomy are these prolapse uterus okay prolapse uterus fibroid uterus adenomyosis genital malignancies dysfunctional uterine bleeding and hysterectomy for obstetric causes like rupture uterus and severe postpartum hemorrhage okay so these are the indications for hysterectomy okay what are the indications for myomectomy the indications for myomectomy are symptomatic fibroids for women less than 40 years okay symptomatic fibroids for women less than 40 years more than 40 years will be proceeding with hysterectomies less than 40 years it's myomectomy uh, fibroids associated with infertility will be doing a myome myomectomy submucous fibroids again will be doing a myomectomy so these are the indications for myomectomy okay so um, see this instrument this instrument on the first look uh, it appears like an artery forceps but this is not exactly an artery forceps okay I have artery forceps here this is the straight artery forceps okay now these two look the same okay though they look the same the main important difference is that here in the tip there is no tooth like extension there is no sharp tooth whereas in this instrument you can see a sharp tooth here on the tip and this is what is called as Cocker's forceps okay. The one with tooth is Cocker's, Cocker's forceps and where do we use this Cocker's forceps? This Cocker's forceps is again used during hysterectomies to clamp the uterosacral and the McEnroth's ligament, okay. To clamp the uterosacral and the McEnroth's ligament, we use this Cocker's uh, forceps, okay. So, this is uh, artery forceps, fine. Again, one other confusing point is that artery forceps and needle holder looks alike, okay. So, how do we differentiate an artery forceps and a needle holder? See, this is an artery forceps, straight artery forceps and this is a needle holder. So, both of them are equal in their size but then uh, there is a difference, okay. So, if you see the tip portion, please see here, the shaft is this and the tip is this. The tip portion is longer in an artery forceps when compared to a needle holder. In the needle holder, the tip portion will be short when compared to the artery forceps, okay. Not only this, uh, both of them will have lock but open, when you open and see, please remember in an artery forceps, you will have transverse serrations, okay. In an artery forceps, when you open, artery forceps is nothing but the forceps that is used to hold delicate structures like uh, peritoneum and to uh, occlude the artery wherever needed, okay. So, artery forceps has transverse serrations inside whereas a needle holder will have longitudinal groove inside, okay. A needle holder will have a longitudinal groove inside whereas artery forceps will have transverse serrations inside, okay. This is how it is, fine. So, the last two instruments for our discussion is tissue holding forceps, okay. So, this is a normal tissue holding forceps, one without tooth and one with tooth, okay. So, this is toothed tissue holding forceps, this is non-toothed tissue holding forceps, okay. So, we use it to hold any tissue for that matter, may it be skin or soft tissue or, um, you know, muscle, uh, dep depending on whether it um, it is very delicate, we, we select either a toothed one or a non-toothed one, okay.